Well, um, thank you for coming and joining our celebration. I'll start by a general apology that in trying to cover 10 years of activity at the center, it's a very difficult thing to do in a 50 minute time period. But part of what I'm going to do in, the, in this overview presentation is to sort of give you little tidbits of what we'll, you'll be seeing later in the day as you're able to attend different parts of um, later presentations. So as Jack pointed out, the funding for the CCT originally came in the, in the summer of 2001 as a result of legislation that was passed that was presented to the legislature by Mike Foster and uh, Steve Perry in collaboration with Mark Emmert. Uh, so here's Governor Foster and Mark Emmert at an, one of the early celebrations of um, the, this initiative. And you can see Bill Lane, who was uh, dean of the College of uh, the Orso College of Business Administration, in this picture as well. So Dan Fogel, who was provost at the time, thought that it would be a really good idea that first year, that first fall, to publish the plans for this IT initiative in the Chronicle of Higher Education. So this is a full page ad that showed up in the Chronicle in the fall of 2001 explaining what this initiative was all about. I highlight the first paragraph here and it gives a nice summary of how the funding originated. This year through Mike Foster's leadership the Louisiana legislature approved $22 million in new recurring funding for a statewide information technology initiative to build research capacity, promote economic development and diversification throughout the state. Higher education has been identified as the driver of economic development in this IT arena. Now keep in mind this is 2001 we were still in the dot-com boom just before the bust and so we really benefited significantly from um, the top of that curve with funding coming to support this important, it remains a very important arena um, for economic development. And as the state's flagship institution, LSU, received seven million dollars in recurring funds uh, that budget year and we were charged with a leadership role in this. There were four other institutions across the state that also received funding through this initiative. Louisiana Tech, ULL, UNO, and Southern. If you really want to know more about the background of what led up to this initiative, um, I urge you to talk to Harold Silverman who's sitting right square in the middle of the audience here. Harold um, has played a number of administrative roles, important administrative roles for this institution over the years and retired a few years ago, but he, he has come back and joined us today for this celebration and he really knows the scoop, so if you want to hear the background story, chat with Harold. Another very important thing that happened uh, indicating broad support from the state for this IT initiative um, and building on our efforts was in the, two, in the fall of 2004, Governor Kathleen Blanco announced that the state would co commit $40 million to build an optical network tying together the research universities across the state of Louisiana. So it was a forty million dollar commitment over ten years. This, the plan for Lonnie was developed by the leadership of the CCT at that time and presented to Governor Blanco and she really picked up on the idea and promoted it and the Lonnie initiative has been critically important to the success uh, of research and, and teaching activities here at LSU over the past six or seven years. And Governor Jindal also has played an important role. I'll point out, I'll start by pointing out that at the International Supercomputing 
event that happened in New Orleans last this past November in uh, 2010, um, Governor Jindal actually issued a proclamation. Um, I'm pleased to join the IEEE in leadership of Supercomputing 10 conference in promoting November 14th through 19th as Supercomputing Week in Louisiana. So we appreciated the additional visibility we got from this, but more importantly, I think from the general administration support, this year um, we've got the approval to move forward, this, the university got the approval to, approval to move forward with building a new building. And most of the individuals in this room are going to get to make use of that new building and we're quite excited about uh, its, this moving forward. Okay, this full page I had in the Chronicle of Higher Education also announced that we were opening a search to bring in a director for what, we, what was called at the time LSU Capital. And just for a historical record, Capital stands for Center for Applied Information Technology and Learning. Now this is an acronym, a tongue twister, that Dan Fogel, an English professor, sort of uh, invented for the center. And uh, when Ed Seidel got here as director, he, th he decided that wasn't quite going to be uh, rolling off the tongue easily enough, so eventually it was changed um, to um, the CCT. Oops, I'm going fast much too fast. Um, so here we opened up in an, a search for a new director and I point out that one of the key individuals in our success in attracting a new director was actually Jorge Pullen and I don't know that most of you know this but Jorge had just arrived from uh, we just brought him from Penn State to join the physics faculty as uh, part of the uh, physics program support for the LIGO experimental project out in Livingston Parish and Jorge knew Ed Seidel very well and Jorge, I remember, approached me and said, hey, do you think we probably could get Ed here? So this was in early 2002, and we in fact started contacting Ed, and it took us a year and a half, and what was it, Harold, five trips for Ed to visit before convincing him? And so I also want to add Harold back in the mix here, because uh, Harold was a, a instrumental in recruiting um, Ed Seidel here from the Albert Einstein Institute, the Max Planck Institute in Germany um, in the summer of 2003. So it's going to be difficult for me to sort of clarify as I go through things this morning exactly who is responsible for various things in over the past seven or eight years. But I generally want to acknowledge up front here that we need to appreciate that Ed provided leadership for the center that was instrumental in getting us to where we are over the five year period from 2003 to 2008. And then Steve Beck and Jorge um, accepted the challenge of being interim co-directors from uh, 2000, when Ed left until uh, 2010 and then in December I stepped in, in December of 2010 I stepped in as director. But it's really due to the leadership of these individuals that we are where we are today. Okay, I want to I want to highlight the accomplishments of the center in three broad categories. And the one that we're probably best known for is, is uh, the assistance or the leadership that the CCT has played both at LSU and across the state in building really good modern IT infrastructure, um, a cyber infrastructure broadly named, both in terms of high performance computing capabilities but also in, in modern networking capabilities. So the first step we made in that direction is um, the we used about approximately half of the initial fund, the first year's funding for the, this IT initiative to purchase a very large Linux cluster. And we named it SuperMike. And there's a mixture of stories as to how we came up with that name, but I'll let you sort of imagine it yourself. 
Um, I wanted to show this picture um, to remind myself to point out that a lot of what we have accomplished the past 10 years, particularly on the cyber infrastructure side, could not have been done without tremendous support and, and cooperation from information technology services here on the campus. So almost everything I say in the first, at least third of this presentation, I, could, I have to say that ITS was intimately involved in this work. And here's Bill Beyer, who was director of uh, SNCC at the time that we did this and some of you recognize Brian here who then subsequently left to go to the University of Minnesota's supercomputing center. Okay, so rather than me trying to say in words what Super Mike was all about, I thought I'd play this video. Saw that they got great value for what they were investing in. 
It had to be performance that was truly global in its competitiveness, and it had to be delivered at a price that everybody would understand. I think what we got for the time, the price, and the performance is truly extraordinary, and we're all delighted with that combination of factors. So I, I decided that showing that would be useful for different members of the audience here who'd be paying attention to different aspects of it. But the young guy in there, this is the tie he was actually wearing. So just to prove it, you know, it is the same person that... Um, but I also want to point out that of the four individuals that were interviewed, three of them have gone on to successful positions elsewhere and I got left behind here. So as, as most of you know, Mark Emmert is now president of in CAA and Priya Vashista, who's featured here, I really wanted to show it in part to give a, a nod to Priya's group. Priya arrived from Argonne National Labs in, in 1991 and spent the decade from 91 to 2001 really building up expertise in high performance computing here that then ultimately began, a, was a stepping stone for the IT initiative. So I wanted to show it for that reason as well. Monica Lee, who was the single systems operator <laughs> for this new machine, uh, moved on to a very nice job in industry in New Zealand uh, where she owned property already so uh, that's where she wanted to be. Um, you can, those of you familiar with the technologies would have picked up on sort of 2.2 teraflops, the size of the cache, uh, various things. We've moved quite a ways from that, riding the wave over the past decade. Um, if you look at what some of the themes were from science and economic development standpoint, this was pre-Katrina pre-oil spill and we were you know we were projecting that it was going to be useful to have at least a, a, this kind of high performance computing tool around to help the state with what might what might happen in the future and so you can you can judge for yourself whether or not we've made progress uh, on various aspects of this another point I want to make here is that this was not a piece put together by university relations, but Intel actually approached us at that time because this was the first really large commodity cluster that was built at an academic institution. Intel wanted to use it in its PR uh, worldwide and so Intel hired a professional film crew from New Orleans because nothing like that existed in Baton Rouge at the time. That's changed, but a sound uh, group came to, up here from New Orleans and uh, spent a lot of time putting together this, uh, this clip. So many things have happened since then. I'm just gonna highlight some of them here. The Lonnie Project um, has provided high bandwidth optical network connectivity uh, between Louisiana's uni research universities. In addition, as part of the statewide Lonnie project, the, there were high performance computers placed at different geographical locations in the state with, a, with the cornerstone machine being a system called Queen B and I'll let you guess how the name of that came about but uh, Queen B which is uh, still running and supporting uh, the state's research activities um, is located, that machine is located downtown Baton Rouge. Um, Ed Seidel led a a development here at the center over a period of several years really pushing us to the point where we would be competitive and nationally competitive in terms of securing funding from NSF to become a supercomputing center, one of NSF's supercomputing centers. That didn't quite work out but we came this close in 2008 we were second in the competition at NSF for a $30 million award uh, to land a big machine here. Ultimately, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center got that award, ended up never did produce the machine they promised, so they should have come to LSU, they should have come to CCT, and we would have pulled that off. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, 
we were able to add Queen B as a resource to the national audience of supercomputing users through NS as a part of the NSF TerraGrid. On the LSU campus itself, we've had an upgrade of SuperMic to a system that we now use called TESPER. And funds are in place with the help of ITS and, and the Chancellor um, this year to purchase a new system to upgrade, te to replace TESPER. And so in 2012, spring, late spring 2012, we expect to install a system that is instead of the original super mic was 2.2 teraflops and we're going to go up to a, a factor of 100 uh, in a decade um, since the original super mic. So we're looking forward to, to that upgrade. Um, I will make just a quick remark about the Lonnie project um, and remind you that also, the, the, the Alani initiative was a, an idea that, that Ed brought to CCT working closely with Charlie McMahon from, from ITS and Charlie ultimately became an integral part of the CCT's activities. But in 2004, there was a, a group of higher education institutions around the country that were formulating plans to tie together major research universities through a high bandwidth connection called the National Lambda Rail. This was the projected footprint before the Lonnie project was funded. And notice how we're left out here to waste <laughs> all on our own with no cut connectivity. With the Lonnie initiative, which came again as a result of a commitment of funding from uh, Kathleen Blanco's administration. The final footprint for NLR changed quite a bit and we became a primary node in, law, in the National Lambda Rail and for Internet 2 and we continue to play that role. So we actually changed the activities here led by the CCT and, um, and perform, carried out at the state level really did change the, on a national scale what the footprint of modern network connectivity is for higher education. Okay, so that's the cyber infrastructure piece. The, Research and instruction. If I go back to that ad that was placed in Chronicle of Higher Education in the fall of 2001, it was announced that we were undergoing a broad range of searches to hire faculty in key areas. And what the advertisement identified was these areas uh, as areas of emphasis at the time. You can judge for yourself whether we've made a success in those specific areas, but we certainly were successful um, over from 2002 on to now in bringing a number of um, key faculty onto the CCT's staff and, fil and threaded through the institution. But before I get to the complete list, I thought Rudy in particular might be interested in seeing, I pulled a few slides from a talk that was presentation done in early 2003, just six months before Ed Seidel got here. And so this is a slide from January of 2003 announcing that there were two, three hires made in the College of Business. Sonia is still on the faculty. Um, these two guys came and left <laughs> after a few years. But um, another slide that was in that group that we were announcing sort of prematurely was that we were making a major hire for the new department chair in electrical and computer engineering. This ended up not actually happening, but it was something we, were, we thought was about to happen. But then this slide, I didn't change anything on this slide, Rudy, and the two other Others were being hotly pursued at the time, and this was when we were recruiting Ed, and uh, we were very pleased that the College of Business was able to bring um, Rudy into our midst. So, where are we today? Over the past decade, we've brought 26 
faculty, actually slightly more than that, but we currently have on staff 26 faculty. Now this is the list of faculty that are in tenure, tenure track positions and all of the faculty that receive at least a portion of their base nine month salary out of CCT funds. On average, there's 50-50 support. So on average, those faculty receive half their nine month salary from the CCT budget and half from their home department. Um, and I notice I put as of January 2012 because I really wanted to get Michael Berlinski on here. Michael is the, uh, will be the most recent hire arriving as a, a biology faculty member in uh, coming in January. I purposely did not attach the departmental affiliation here because I want to emphasize that that's not how we think about research at CCT. We don't think about it in terms of traditional academic boundaries. This is a group of faculty that interact in a different way outside of their traditional departments uh, through the center's activities. And so let me sketch for you a picture version of how we think about the uh, collaborative interactions at the center. The CCT reports, the director of CCT reports to the Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development and through Tom Cly to the Provost which is quite distinct from the traditional academic uh, ad academic affairs reporting structure of individual colleges and each college having a number of departments identified under it. All of the departments report through the deans of the colleges to the provost and the CCT sits in a, a separate administrative structure. The center has identified in terms of its research activities five primary focus areas and I'm not going to say a lot about these in the overview this morning because in the rest of the talks later this morning you'll hear highlighted uh, various activities that are going on in these different focus areas. But let me show you how faculty in individual focus areas are distributed across the traditional disciplines. So let's take the Avatar initiative and digital media initiative there are six or seven, depending on how I count. Each one of these green dots identifies a faculty member that's part of the digital active digital media program we call Avatar. Where are their home departments? Where does their tenure reside? Two are computer scientists. One is in electrical and computer engineering. Two are musicians. One is in the School of Mass Communications. And then Derek Ostrinko, who we just hired this fall, I haven't added his, <laughs> the College of um, Art and Design houses the School of Art and Derek is their first faculty hire in the CCT and he's in the um, School of Art. So the Avatar program has that distribution across, cutting across traditional academic disciplines. Every yellow dot is also a faculty member but identified in what we call the core computation arena. And to show you the distribution of those faculty, two are in computer science, four in mathematics, and one in electrical and computer engineering. And I can do that for the other focus areas, and I think there are actually 25 dots here. The 26 would be Derek, who's off screen. And so it's in this sense that the CCT really tries to operate and does operate as a horizontal slice across the university. And the way I like to think about it is if you could just tear down all of the academic departments, tear down those boundaries and think about what connections would you like to have in re your research activities on a daily basis? Who would you like to be interacting with? And quite often you'll find that there are faculty and research groups and other units that you'd like to be interacting with on a daily basis. The CCT provides that additional thread and with the focus areas highlighting uh, areas of interdisciplinary research that really benefit from um, this cross-fertilization. 
Another way I like to describe the research activities of the CCT, and I know some of you are going to get tired of seeing this slide, but it's, the, it's a way, I think, a, a good way of presenting how we, uh, how we th think about the role of the center on this campus. Pick any traditional academic arena, astrophysics, biochemistry, coastal studies, and let me pick on astrophysics since that's my particular area. Traditionally, there have been two branches of these fields. One is experimental or observational side of that discipline and the other would be the theoretical side where the theoretical side is typically you figure out what set of equations describe the nature of the phenomenon that you're trying to study and it takes disciplinary expertise in order to understand what underlying equations for describing nature are relevant to this particular phenomenon. And so in astrophysics, for example, in understanding the structure of stars, there's a set of mathematical equations that astronomers have, un have understood now are, are relevant for governing the evolution of stars. Well, these mathematical equations are typically very difficult to solve, impossible to solve with pencil and paper, so we all now rely on computing technology to help us do that. And as the computers become more powerful, we're able to tackle these phenomena or begin to understand the ph phenomena in much more detail, um, the complexity in much more detail. So computational science is now becoming an integral, sort of a third leg in any disciplinary science that you might think about. But it doesn't matter what discipline you're in, whether you're in coastal studies, biochemistry, astrophysics, in order to get from the theoretical math foundation of that disciplinary um, expertise to a solution of these equations generated by computers that dump out reams of data so you've got to get to a solution that you can actually understand to get from there to here, from there to here, from there to here, you need the same tools and expertise no matter what discipline you're in. So here I'm illustrating, for example, in order to get from the set of theoretical equations we think are relevant to stellar structure, in order to get from there to a modeling solution that we can interpret and understand and compare with nature, we need to map these equations into a discrete form that a computer can actually understand. We actually have to understand how to program the computer, what compilers to use, what language to use in order to map the discrete equations into the machine. If you've got massively parallel systems, you've got to understand how to talk with tens of thousands of processors simultaneously. You've got to be looking years down the road at what the new hardware is going to be in order to be prepared to map your model to the new hardware. You've got to understand networking technology and ultimately most of us use scientific visualization tools to interpret the data that comes out of these simulations. So all of this expertise is needed no matter what disciplinary science you're in. And the CCT invests about half of its resources in, in people in providing this core expertise that underpins all of modern simulation work uh, in science, engineering, and even human, uh, art and humanities. So roughly half of the faculty that we've hired in the CCT are computational scientists with certain domain specializations and the other half we've hired in who do fundamental research in all of these core areas that underpin uh, modern simulation research. So that's all of the research talks that you're going to hear later today. Uh, I, I think it'll help for you to, to think of them sitting in this context and underpinning um, research across many, many different disciplines.
Another point I want to make about our hiring um, experience is that We've hired some very, very good individuals and in baseball terms we've served at a very good farm club for other institutions. <laughs> that is, we bring in good people, they show that they're good here and they demonstrate that by getting very, very good jobs elsewhere. <laughs> so just in the past three years, and this doesn't include everybody that has come to the CCT and since uh, left, um, but Charlie McMahon who's, who uh, has gone on to be uh, the chief technology officer and information officer at Tulane University, um, Dan Katz, who's gone on to the University of Chicago. Um, Yarick has gone on to lead the group in Notre Dame. Um, Shantanu has just gone to a faculty position at, at Rutgers. Tefik has gone to a faculty position at uh, State University of New York in Buffalo. Uh, Eric Schnatter has gone to the Perimeter Institute in Canada. Thomas Sterling's gone to uh, Indiana University. Um, these are all individuals who we think have permanently left us. But in addition to that, all of you know that Eric, uh, Eric, that Ed stepped out of his position as director of CCT to accept what we think is a temporary position at the National Science Foundation. Uh, Ed's still a faculty member here. He's been gone for now uh, three and a half years. And it's really a tribute to, another tribute to the visibility of the center that the director of NSF invited Ed to come take the vision that he had implemented here and the spark that, spark that he had ignited here and come to uh, NSF's office of, of cyber infrastructure to lead that uh, big program for the country. Since Ed arrived at NSF, his skills and his vision have been appreciated outside of cyber infrastructure context and Ed now is head of the largest funding division of NSF, Mathematical and Physical Sciences. Uh, and Gab Allen, who it still remains on the faculty here, is in a two-year rotator position in the Office of Cyber Infrastructure at CCT, uh, excuse me, at the NSF. So, you know, we've got good people here, and to prove it, we're serving as a very good farm club to other groups. Where are we headed in terms of uh, building faculty expertise? Well, we've just been given permission um, by the Provost's office to open up two broad searches in these two areas that I've described for you. That is, roughly half of our faculty are in applications areas. The other half sort of build expertise in this core uh, computational uh, area and so we're advertising to fill multiple positions, hopefully multiple positions in these two areas and we will be conducting dis discussions across college boundaries to identify uh, particularly in the applications areas, what are the areas most critical to this institution that we ought to be recruiting this year. I'll point out that as the search gets underway um, Sue Brenner, who's uh, in, on the faculty of mathematics, is, will be chairing this broad search and Mark Gerald, uh, who's on the faculty in physics and astronomy, will be chairing, is chairing that broad search. Okay, I can't leave this research and instruction topic without highlighting briefly um, Avatar, our digital media uh, program. Now Steve Beck will be t um, talking later uh, this afternoon and providing more details about the Avatar uh, program. But I do want to highlight that there's a, the Avatar program has put in place an undergraduate minor in digital media with two tracks, an arts track and a technology track that is proving to be very uh, inviting for undergraduate students. It's open for students in any uh, disciplinary major. And uh, the Avatar program has been, has led the, the or actually created, uh, the leadership of Avatar has created this concept of a 
Red Stick International Animation Festival, which this is our seventh year. This will be our seventh year to put on an animation festival downtown at the Shaw Center. And this festival has always gets the broad support of the Baton Rouge community and the local area and the mayor's office in particular. And Steve, I kind of drug up this old slide too that the, some of the seeds of the Avatar program, although they started even in the, uh, the 90s, um, early on with the CCT initiative, we structured a, cre a creative technology laboratory, a CTL, and had early discussions of, with an advisory panel out in the Los Angeles area and a number of us flew out to the LA area and spent several days interacting with uh, industry leaders there and I brought these slides. Harold, there you are also. Um, there's Ralph uh, from the School of Journalism uh, from Manship School and I particularly wanted to show it because Jorge Aravina was a strong supporter from the beginning and, and Jorge passed away this past year and just as a nod and thanks to him I thought I would show that slide. Okay, well I said that we're going to, you're going to hear more about these various activities today. Um, the La Sigma, Mark Gerald is going to talk about the material world focus area and in particular the, the large La Sigma project. Um, the coast through porous media to black holes, this is going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> TBA are my new initials. <laughs> Highlights in computational mathematics, Sue Brenner is going to present that talk and Ram Ramanujan is going to talk about hardware futures. And then a few highlighted individual research projects by Jay Park, Hartmut Kaiser, and Brig Ulmer will be right after lunch and then Steve will step in and uh, kick off the discussion of the, some more information about the Avatar program. Okay, so then also I want to highlight the CCT's activities in outreach and economic development. CCT faculty and research staff have in every aspect of their work bring students into the activity. And boy, really when the summer gets here, things really get rolling in terms of uh, activities that we involve uh, high school and undergraduate students all the way up through graduate programs. This slide is just to remind myself to talk about uh, supercomputing this past year. Um, there was actually a comp an, an international competition that uh, in terms of students teaming together and being challenged to build the most efficient operating program on a piece of hardware that's presented to them, a piece of high performance computing hardware. We entered this competition with help from a number of individuals sitting around the room here but with uh, also staff from uh, ITS here on campus and the students came in second in this competition and uh, we were very proud of that showing. Some other examples, this idea of a tightly coupled commodity cluster that supports high performance computing, that general architecture is, is referred to as a Beowulf architecture named by our friend Thomas Sterling when uh, he was one of the co-inventors of that concept. And so when Thomas was here, we started an annual Beowulf boot camp where we bring high school students in and also some of their teachers to spend a week immersed in how you put together, how you build clusters from scratch and how you operate them in a high performance computing mode. So we have Beowulf boot camp activities. We scaled that to middle school women this past summer and ran two separate one week camps called Alice in Computation Land. 
We also uh, shifted to mobile applications this summer and, and asked the question, what if every LSU freshman entered LSU with the capability, the understanding of how to program a mobile device, an iPhone or an iPad? What would it take to teach students how to do that even if they don't have any programming skills? So we set up a two-week boot camp invited students, not just entering freshmen, but students across the undergraduate curricula here at LSU to come participate at, in this experimental <laughs> two-week uh, course, and they ate it up. We had 55 students participate for two weeks um, from many different disciplines. How many? 28 different disciplines. <laughs> And the two most populated, the students that, the two largest groups were computer science, but Manship School of Journalism were, had the biggest group of takers. But um, with that ended up being a fun activity that we're, we're definitely going to continue in future years. Um, in terms of our outreach and economic development activities, the the cyber infrastructure for the campus and across Lonnie, as well as local research expertise has been instrumental in helping to understand the storm modeling for the coast. Here's uh, some images taken from uh, Katrina simulations done after the fact, combining uh, lots of different data sets to understand really how that storm operated and what the storm surge results were. From the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, again, some of the tools that we have, cyber infrastructure we have, as well as research expertise, has been used to try to understand certain aspects of what went wrong um, with this explosion. And here are some simulated streamlines from the, um, from the origin of the oil that was done by a group led by Samanacharya, but these are images Werner Banger produced. And then as a last aspect of interface with economic development, Okay, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but, but I will just I show that as a, this is the trailer that uh, Electronic Arts, that EA used at the E3 conference in uh, LA this past year, announcing all of their new releases. Um, I got this from... Um, Maria Radulovic Nostich yes, uh, yesterday or Monday when she was visiting the campus recruiting students for internships in EA's summer programs around the North America and so I put that in there just to wake you up and and as a as a catcher for our um, involvements up to now in with EA and CCT certainly was instrumental I should mention in particular Stacy Simmons who was on the CCT staff who since has left to pursue her own uh, venture capital um, funded project. But the CCT with uh, Stacy's leadership brought a, helped the state recruit uh, EA's North American Test Center, its Quality Assurance Center to um, the city which is as con is very important to the city and the state and as all of you know we now have a, a promise of a new building that we will be co-located in with uh, EA. Electronic Arts is going to occupy the third floor, CCT the second floor and um, half of the, the first floor. This is from the groundbreaking ceremony where we see our Chancellor Martin 
Mayor Holden and the governor here, and also Mike Robinson from EA. Just so everybody's on the same page about this, the building is going to be constructed here. So here's the stadium. This is uh, Johnston Hall where we currently sit. No, that's Johnston, where we current, CCT currently resides. So this is right at the south gate of campus near the lake shore and it's next to the LE, uh, Louisiana, Louisiana Technology Center building number one. Again, this is from the groundbreaking ceremony with uh, Stephen Moray pictured here from the Department of, Secretary of the Department of uh, Economic Development, again with Mike Robinson from EA. And here's our groundbreaking, and I thought I'd show Steve. Where's Steve? Well, anyway, if I got him in the next picture smiling at us, so, <laughs> so uh, well, that's a um, keepsake. Just Monday, I drove by the site. They actually are digging dirt. Um, the sign here with trenches dug and that machine was actually active. Um, they really are saying that it's a 12-month project. So by September, October next year, they are aiming for it to be finished. So we're excited about that. And just as a final note then, in today's program, um, mid-afternoon, we're going to have some more information about our outreach activities and industry relations with some testimonials coming from some students and teachers that have participated in some of those programs. So, closing remarks. I want to show the, the leadership images here again, but also to remind myself that it's really largely due to the fantastic staff that has been, that's grown inside the center, many of whom were able to attend today because I gave them the day off. They could come over and play with us and we really appreciate uh, this really strong core of uh, staff um, to support our efforts and we've built a very large and robust um, research staff beyond the faculty that are in tenure, tenure track lines, and you'll hear more about their um, activities um, in other discussions, uh, other talks throughout the day.